All right, so you're good with the clothes? Yeah. We've got Alicia stuff here. And we're embarking on uh, giving a, a great gift. <laughs> So I've been an organ donor for 20 years. I never, ever thought that it would come down to where I would be a living donor. In November, I had a lot of cramps going on through my body. I, had, um, I asked my wife to uh, make an appointment to the doctors. He, well, he initially called me and said he had to speak with me in person. I knew it, it was devastating news. I would say for, for two months at least, I was in a real dark place. I was, I was mad at the world. and. Um, really thought it was the end of the world when in, in, in all reality there's there's treatments for uh, kidney disease. I never thought twice about doing it either when we found out that my brother had kidney failure and that he would definitely need a transplant. My first thought was okay so when do we all get tested? Yeah. Do you know why I why I have to give a kidney to Uncle Coon? Because his kidneys were failing. They are and what would happen if they failed? He might die. My worst fear is that for some reason the transplant won't take. I'm not worried about myself. If I could save my brother's life, I mean, what more could you ask for? He'd do the same thing for me. He would. You're done. <laughs> and we are on our way, headed to Birmingham, Alabama. Guys, are you being nice to each other? Nine hours into the car ride, are we getting a little bit car crazy? One quarter of a mile at exit two, Birmingham. Hold your breath. Sherry um, strikes me as someone who is uh, incredibly motivated, uh, incredibly committed to this. Nope, no backing out now. This is it. And there's no doubt that living donors are some of the most special people that we encounter in transplant. I think it's important to remember and something that we really emphasize is that these are people who are taking on a risk with no direct medical benefit for themselves. It hasn't bothered me much and now it's like I can feel the butterflies in my stomach as we get ready to go. It's like just having a zen moment, just having some REM. Yeah, definitely having some REM. Uh, there are about 100,000 people in the United States waiting for kidney transplants right now and we're only able to do about 17,000 kidney transplants a year and we're limited by the donor supply. Families can be brought together, uh, even strangers can be brought together through this. And there's a, a lifelong bond that's formed when someone donates a kidney. When I first called my mom and told her that I was a match, she was happy, but then all of a sudden she got worried. You know, okay, now, now I have two kids who are going to have surgery, and two kids who are only going to have one kidney, you know. And so she's worried for us both. Be a mother. I could not sleep because now I know two kids. If one kid try to help other, and if it don't work out, like, what happened? I lose two kids in one time. The hardest part is sitting in that waiting room, watching the clock, and wondering what's going on. We have Sherry's donor surgery, and then we have her brother's transplant. Sherry's surgery will start uh, first in the morning, where we disconnect her kidney from its circulation and from the bladder. Uh, at the same time, the transplant recipient operation is starting in an adjacent room. We time the surgeries so that uh, when the kidney is ready to be removed from Sherry, it's immediately then ready to be implanted into her brother. Uh, Sherry's brother surgeon will prepare that for transplant and then over the next 45 minutes to an hour, recreate those connections of the circulation of the bladder. And in the majority of cases, we would expect to see that kidney starting to work before the transplant operation is finished. She's in recovery and uh, everything's fine. When is planned? Yeah. Good. The doctor said she was perfect, did a little Howard, dance and everything. And I, I, I crying, I crying, I, I just crying because I worry until yesterday I see her come out, she talk. Then I know, okay, one kid already, one kid, okay. So when I come over here, I see good, then I feel so much better, so much better. And my dad came and we chatted for a while. Bad muscle stuff didn't, didn't hurt hardly much at all. So. Well, that's good. Yeah, so feeling pretty, pretty strong. Well, you're looking good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. <laughs> Nurses, I, <laughs> I keep bugging them and bugging them and bugging them and asking, is my brother out of surgery? Is my brother out of surgery? So um, they 
said he was coming down the hallway and um, the nurse opened up the door and my brother came by on a stretcher and they stopped and asked him how he's doing and he said he's doing okay and he said how he's feeling and he said he's in a lot of pain but you know that's to be expected and and uh, I just told him I love you and I'll see you soon. My kid, I think they are really good kid. I told my kid, if I die now, I'm happy because I know they, have, they take care of each other. So I'm very happy. Yeah. I'm excited and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I want to be normal again. I want to feel normal. Yeah. I hope tomorrow he will start his life anew and feel a hundred times better. I want to give you a hug. Don't stress yourself. Oh, my sister. Oh. I feel oh, I love you more. Lance Corporal Christopher Dean Clark died more than two years ago. Hard to believe, ain't it, Nuna? I can see him shaking his head right now. Mm -hmm. His mother is heartbroken, empty, frustrated. Yeah, just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. This headstone at Quantico National Cemetery is nearly all Elmira Walker has left of her oldest son. He always been sort of like a caretaker for me. So Chris, he had a special, really, really special place in my heart, you know, because he always sort of been there. When Chris missed calling his mom on her birthday two years ago, Elmira suspected something was wrong. Several weeks later, her fears were confirmed. Chris had been dead for days, all alone inside his Atlanta apartment. He passed away from complications of diabetes. And uh, when I got to Georgia, I was just I just could not believe that Chris was gone. I even went there and knocked on the door where he used to live because I, I just could not believe it. There just was so much of his presence there, you, you know, in the house. You know, it just felt just like he was still there. With the help of her other sons, Elmira packed Chris's belongings into his truck. She planned to bring it all back here to D.C. to sort it out, a painful process that should have been fairly simple, but it wasn't. Instead of unpacking pictures and memories of Chris, she got hit with one frustration after another. Chris's truck, with all of his stuff inside, got repossessed. The company that repoed the truck agreed to hold everything while Elmira made arrangements to pick it up. But Elmira couldn't afford to go back to Georgia and time was running out. So she went to D.C.'s Department of Veterans Affairs for help. That's when she told me, said, well, you came to the right place because, say, Marines take care of their own. That's what she told me, said, and said, said well, you don't have to worry, said, you're in good hands. So that really took a, made me feel so much better because I feel like then that everything going to be taken care of. But it wasn't. Barbara Pittman works in D.C.'s VA office. She tried to do as much as she could to help Elmira bring Chris's belongings home. She called the Marine Corps League. They connected Elmira to a third-party veteran support organization in Georgia. They agreed to drive Chris's things back to D.C. I just sit by the window sometime and just waited for the truck to arrive. Nothing ever came. Elmira's wait turned from days to weeks to months. She kept going back to D.C.'s Veterans Affairs office, hopeful her things would show up. I've been there, I know, a hundred times down to the VA. Every time I would go, she would tell me the things are on the way. I tried to help her, but then a lot of other things just got in the middle of there. The veterans organization that was supposed to deliver Chris's belongings claims the items were damaged after being left outside in the elements. I just want someone to be accountable for it. If I can just hear them say we made a mistake or they got lost, then I know they're gone. But in the meantime, it seems like it just, it's, it's up in the air that there has not been no closure. What happened to Chris's belongings? All the pictures and the memories. They could have been damaged and thrown out. Someone could have stolen them. We just don't know for sure. But what we do know is that nearly two years after his death. I never received anything. No papers, no pictures, no nothing, nothing. Frustrated, empty, heartbroken. All she has left of her firstborn son is a headstone. The American flag from his funeral, 
a letter of appreciation from President Obama and a football jersey she found in his apartment. He did it with his pride and joy because this was, looked like it was right there so I could see it when I came there to the house and uh, so I took this, so this really, really special for me right here. So I keep it all the time. And what does it say on the back? It says Simple Fi on the back. Mm -hmm. Simper Fi, the Marine motto for always faithful. He um, always depended on me for to do the right thing. So in my heart and my mind, I'm, I'm doing this for him and not only for him, but for others, you know, speaking on behalf of other mothers too that, you know, they lost their children too.